And for the third webinar in this series, the Travelers AI, uh, I'm Vinod Ayengar, I'm the Director of Marketing and Partnerships at h 2 AI. Uh, we are really excited for all of us uh, to have you all join this webinar. Um, a couple of uh, items before we get started. Uh, is everyone able to hear me fine? Uh, if yes, can you just say yes on the, on the chat bar in your GoToWebinar panel on the right? If um, anyone is able to hear, I haven't seen any yeses yet. Yet. The uh, questions, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. I see a few yeses coming in. Looks like everyone is able to hear us fine. Um, so that's the place where you can <coughs> ask questions as well, and we'll get to the questions right at the end. Uh, we have a small Q and A session, uh, and we'll pick up you and answer them. Um, so, uh, let me introduce our two speakers for today. Um, our first speaker is Andy Steinbeck. He's a senior director at NVIDIA and leads the AI efforts at NVIDIA for financial services. Our next speaker is Patrick Hall from h 2 AI. He's the director of data science and he leads efforts around machine learning interpretability. Um, so, with that, with that saying, uh, let's go to the next slide, Patrick. Next slide, please. So let's look at the agenda quickly. Um, we're going to walk through sort of the motivation for, the, for interpretability. Why do we need machine learning interpretability? Um, and while we do that, we'll also uh, look at an introduction towards travel AI for folks who might not have seen this before. And then we'll jump right ahead into the different techniques for interpretability followed by a live demo. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Andy Steinbeck. Thanks, Vinod. Patrick, next slide. So I want to start with. Uh, a typical enterprise machine learning workflow. So you see on the left here one of the classic pain points that, that deals with the um, integration, assembly, and cleaning of data. But on the right is another set of pain points associated with the drive to build and the quest for more higher performance models um, recently. And so that involves uh, things like doing feature engineering on the modeling table, using more complex models like gradient boosted trees and then even doing things like ensembling and stacking of models and so to get high performance models it requires a cycle of building many models often hundreds or even thousands of models and processes like feature engineering can be very slow so you end up with a whole series of models to both evaluate for performance and and to understand and so one of the great things that H2O has done and that we're um, very happy, we're very proud to be working with H2O at NVIDIA is they've packaged this set of, um, they've packaged this set of performance enhancements into a solution called driverless AI that runs on a multi-GPU server. And Patrick, if you go to the next slide. So you can see that what this drive to build more uh, complex models is, is um, leading to is uh, two things. One is you end up with a lot of complicated models to evaluate and then you have to finally when you choose a model to deploy you have to understand its interpretability and so um, H2O has put together an interpretability package called MLI uh, which stands for machine learning interpretability and it's a toolkit uh, and that's the that's the main focus of the webinar today. Uh, the other thing that the drive to model complexity is leading to is the need to build a lot of models, and that drives the need for GPUs that have thousands of cores on a single chip instead of just a few cores. And so if you go to the next slide, Patrick, and start the movie, this is just a demonstration of some of the GPU-enabled uh, machine learning algorithms that H2O has built. And what you'll see here is a demo of a generalized linear model. And this is on a US census data set, and its, it's target is predicting income. And so what you see is that in real time, this is running on an NVIDIA DGX1, which is an eight GPU server compared to a dual socket Xenon server. And uh, the GPU server has already built 1,500 models in the time that the CPU hasn't even built one model. And so 
Um, this gives you a sense of the performance boost that GPUs can give. Um, in the end here, the GPU uh, 8 server bo 8 GPU box will build something like 3,200 models before before the the dual socket Xenon even builds its first model. So we just wanted to show that um, the synergy between the ability to build thousands of models quickly and H2O's new driverless AI solution are really driving the limits of machine learning performance. So with that, uh, Patrick, you can go to the next slide and uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to talk about interpretability of machine learning models. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so, yeah, and I'm, I'm just going to piggyback off that last point that you made. Um, I, I'm really happy to see H2O um, porting algos like linear models, GBMs, trees over to the GPU because from a machine learning interpretability perspective, like, that's what we need. We need to be able to build a lot of uh, linear models quickly, and, and you'll see why later on. But to get started with the demo, so so... Just for a little bit of setup, the way we're going to do this today, um, I'm going to explain the data set we're going to use. Some of you have probably used it before. Uh, then we're going to do this kind of like a kitchen show, like a cooking show. We're going to, uh, you're going to see us set the model up, and then uh, we're going to use a pre-baked model that I ran uh, for about 20 minutes this morning. Uh, so we don't want to take, we don't want to uh, waste time explaining that we could be explaining techniques. Uh, so here, here is the, the description of the data set that we're going to be using. Um, so it's, uh, it's the credit card default data set from Kaggle. And the target is whether someone defaulted on their credit card payment in the next month. Um, and, and the inputs that we're using to make this prediction are their credit limit. And NT dollars means new Taiwanese dollars. So this is, this is a data set from Taiwan. Uh, then we're using what will hopefully be very straightforward things, uh, whether the person was male or female, their education, uh, marital status, age. And then there's these sets of variables that we probably need to explain just a little bit. So uh, their pay, bill amount, and pay amount. And then they're followed by a number. And what that number means is from one month back from the current month. So pay zero is was a payment received in the current month, whereas pay two was, was a payment received two months ago. Same thing for bill amount one, bill amount two, pay amount one, pay amount two. Okay, so let's switch over to the demo. We're gonna get a model started. This is just kind of a placeholder slide. Give me one moment. Switch over to the software. Okay. So this is uh, the home screen of H2O Driverless AI. And what I've done before you guys were on the webinar is I've loaded a data set, and like I said, I kind of pre-baked the model that we're gonna be showing off later. So um, I'm gonna start this process going from the home screen so the audience has a, uh, a feel for what it's like to use this software. So, and again, I've, I've already loaded a data set, and that's the data set we're gonna use, but I'm gonna click on New Experiment, Okay, so driverless AI, uh, you know, it's always blinking, telling me what to do next. It wants me to select or import a data set. Okay, I'll do that. I'm going to take credit card data like we talked about. Select a target column. Okay, so we talked about uh, default payment next month being what we're trying to predict. All right, and I'm going to actually do one more little thing. I'm going to drop the row ID column because we don't want to use that in the model. Okay, now um, I essentially have three tuning parameters here, and this is meant to be very, very approachable. So I want to build an accurate model, so I'm going to turn accuracy up almost all the way to the top, to nine. Uh, like I said, I'm going to let this model run a little bit longer, so I'm going to turn this up to a six. And then, um, just to give ourselves a challenge, since the focus of today is interpretability, I'm going to I'm going to turn down the interpretability bar to make this model even a little bit harder to interpret but you'll see we're still going to be able to get some really good information out of it. I'm going to set a random seed. I'm going to choose log loss. I think automatically it would do AUC. And now I'm going to launch the experiment. And again, you can see some things here about the data set. 
uh, 24,000 rows, uh, some target profiling. But let's go ahead and launch the experiment. All right. So now uh, H2O Driverless AI is getting ready to start build a model, start building a model. And as Andy point, pointed out, we do both feature engineering and model building. And the complexity of that process is controlled by these, these knobs up here, which I discussed earlier. So what's going on right now is uh, some preliminary checks are going on to decide uh, what CPU resources should be allocated for and what GPU resources should be allocated for. Um, and, and once the process gets started, we'll see all kinds of features getting made and uh, we'll see models getting built on those features. And so we're probably going to do about, as this process goes on, we're probably going to do about 200 iterations of um, feature selection, feature engineering, model building. So the final model you're going to see when we, when we discuss the interpretability, when we try to interpret the model, is going to be about 200 rounds of feature engineering and model building, and the final model will be built on, uh, on that last best selected feature set. And you can see here the, uh, the GPU usage. So this is, a, um, this is a Amazon single GPU instance, so you have some idea of, of the horsepower we have here. It's not, it's not an unbelievably beefy machine or something. Um, so certainly a machine that you would certainly have access to. And so here we have our first round of uh, feature engineering. And we've, we've built these uh, features which have to do with target encoding and the frequency of certain categorical variables. Okay, but remember I said this was going to be like a cooking show. So we had our kind of pre-made ingredients. Oh, now we've got another set of variables. Um, and we're going to put this into the oven and uh, we're going to talk about some of the interpretability techniques and come back to it. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is machine learning interpretability is a little bit of a, uh, of a mindset change from, from interpreting linear models. And uh, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind is in linear models, we're oftentimes building an approximate model, but we learn in high school or college, you know, in the first statistics class we take, how to interpret these models very exactly. So we all, you know, if we fit a linear model before in high school or college, we all learned uh, to interpret it, we look at the regression coefficient, and in this case, let's say the regression coefficient is three, uh, we would say for a one unit increase in age, because the age is the x-axis, the number of purchases increases by three on average, right? So we have this very exact approximation. Only problem is the models themselves tend to be approximate. So what I'm putting forward today is the idea that uh, perhaps approximate explanations of more exact models are equally valuable to, to this idea of exact explanations for approximate models. And so here I'm showing a technique um, that is often referred to as LIME, Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on that later. Um, and so what we can do with LIME is we can see we can see where the slope changes, uh, and, and we would be able to make business decisions based on this sort of enhanced local behavior, okay? So let's, let's talk about this difference between global and local. What, and, we'll, we, and we will, so the, uh, this idea of local interpretability is gonna be very important in machine learning interpretability, uh, the, the dashboard we've made, and you'll see and you'll see uh, what we're able to extract is going to be different from this sort of um, global, this, this global interpretability is going to be different from the local interpretability. We're going to be able to zoom in and learn more about these functions. Okay, so how are we going to interpret these models? Well, um, we're going to use a series of techniques, and I'm going to introduce those here. So the first we're one that we're going to talk about is partial dependence plots. And this is kind of an oldie but a goodie. Um, a partial dependence plot shows us the average response, uh, the average Y value across the domain of an input. So here, this is an example from the very famous elements of statistical learning where we're trying to predict home values. 
and you can see that um, when so this is this is probably small, but it says average occupancy. And when average occupancy is small, two people, we can see the model on average predicts a little bit higher than it does when average occupancy is five, and it's a little bit lower. Here we have a two-dimensional partial dependence plot. It's just a little bit easier to see, a little bit bigger. So here we can see um, when average occupancy is high, five, house age really doesn't impact the model. On average, the Y variable isn't changing. It's just staying a straight line. Um, but as uh, average occupancy decreases, all of a sudden, house age really starts making the Y variable get higher, really starts impacting the model. So uh, we would call this an interaction. And partial dependence plots are great for um, understanding the average value of Y based on an input variable value, and then also interactions if we're able to do the 2D plots. Okay, another topic that's going to come up a lot when we discuss the dashboard is surrogate models. And a surrogate model is, is an old data mining trick, uh, but, I, but I think it's, it's good. It's a good trick. So uh, the idea of a surrogate model is I have a complex I have a complex machine learning model, you know, my deep neural network up here, very complex model, and it's been trained on these three inputs and, and these real labels, these real predictions. So if I want to get some insight into this complex model, one thing I can do is I can train a simpler model, like a single decision tree or a single linear model, and we'll do both of those in the dashboard. Um, you'll see that what, what I've done is I've taken these original three inputs, exactly the same columns as up here, and instead of training this simple model on the original predictions, I'm training it on the predictions from the complex model. So in this way, I'm using a simpler model to learn about the important variables, major trends, in a, in a more complex model. Okay. So I brought up Lime, and I kind of showed a, a picture of it before, and, and this is kind of the famous picture of Lime. Um, again, Lime is local interpretable model agnostic explanation, and it's a beautifully simple idea. Um, in Lime, we build local surrogate models. And remember, I kind of I brought up global versus local, and that's something we'll talk about again. Um, so Lime is a local linear surrogate model. So what we're showing in the slide is we have some kind of very complex image recognition image recognition, deep neural network, and uh, what we're doing is we're, we're finding a place on the response function, the, basically the X's and the, and the predictions of Y, and we're fitting a linear model to that. And we're going to use the coefficients and uh, uh, local contributions, the, the inputs times the coefficients to get an understanding of what's going on in this local region, okay? So I think the, the combination of global surrogate models that tell us overall what's going on in the model and local surrogate models that tell us what's going on in a specific place, like we showed in that first slide, is going to be really important. Patrick, th um, this is yeah. Andy. I have a question. Sure. So Thanks. Yeah, so the, just to get this clear, so the, the difference between a surrogate model that would be global and local from a practical perspective would be that a global model you would train on all the rows or all the instances of data, and a local model you would choose, say, a cluster of instances that are very close together and only train on those, and that would be a local model. Is that? Is, am I getting it right? Yeah, I think I think that is I think that is is basically the idea, and that's almost exactly what we do in the in the MLI machine learning interpretability dashboard. Um, so yeah, so thanks for that clarifying question, Andy, and please please keep asking because I know I'm going fast here. Okay, so one of the last techniques we're going to talk about before we jump into the, the dashboard and show the software is uh, variable importance. And probably most people will be familiar with the idea of global variable importance. Uh, this has been common, especially in decision trees, random forests, gradient boosting machines, tree-based models for quite a long time. And uh, the variable importance is just sort of a numeric representation of how often a variable is used to make splits in a decision tree. And a good heuristic for what the uh, variable importance will be is how high 
is a variable in a tree. So we're showing pink here for whether someone is male or female. And uh, so we can see this happen four times and it's happening high in the tree on the second level. So we're gonna say yellow is the fare the person paid. It's a less important variable and you can see it's happening less times and lower down in the tree. So that's, that's a good heuristic for how uh, global variable importance work. Uh, what we're excited about uh, in particular is this idea of local variable importance. Again, global versus local. So what's going on down here in this bottom table? So what we're showing down here in this bottom table is a technique called LOCO, or a variant of a technique called LOCO. Leave one covariant out. That's what LOCO stands for. And so what we're saying is um, when, when I run the, uh, when I train the model using all the variables, I get this prediction, y hat, 0.2. Okay, well what LOCO says is, well what happens um, if I either retrain the model and leave whether someone is male or female out of the model, uh, or set whether someone is male or female to missing, then what happens? So what we see is that the prediction actually changes a lot in this case. If I leave whether someone is male or female out of the model, it changes the prediction from 0.2 down to 0.01. So this would mean that in this row, uh, whether someone is male or female has a big impact. And if we look over at FAIR, if I leave FAIR out, either by setting it to missing or retraining the model without the column FAIR, in this row, when I, change, when I do that, the prediction only changes by 0.01. So we know that FAIR has less of an impact locally in this row. And we're going to refer to that as LOCO. If you hear me say LOCO, that's what we're talking about. Okay. So I think now we can finally... Go to the, the dashboard, go to the software, since you guys have, uh, have some background now. Uh, Andy, any, any questions? You want to move on? No, we, we can move on. Thanks. Okay. All right. So here's our model running. Okay. But like I said, we're going to, uh, now I'm going to pull a pre-baked one out of the oven. Okay. So we're going to switch over. And uh, let me just show you how, how this is done. So here, here again, I'm back to the home page. Here's my experiment that's running, and I'm going to pop this one out of the oven, the one I pre-baked earlier for us. Okay, so when it's all done, when it goes through 200 iterations of feature engineering and, and model building, here's my list of features. Uh, and we can see that the log loss has been driven down by this feature engineering technique which I just think is so cool, this automatic feature engineering technique. Be sure to tune in to the next webinar for that. Uh, but what we're here to talk about today is interpreting the model. So I'm going to hit interpret this model. And now we're going to see some of those techniques that we, that we just talked about. So up here in the, in the left corner we have our, our LIME, our Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. Here we're going to have our global and local variable importance made by GBM variable importance and then loco leave one covariant out variable importance. Down here we have our global decision tree surrogate model and uh, here in the bottom right we have partial dependence. And I think partial dependence if you're not used to it it's a little bit easier to talk about a uh, numeric value. Okay so how would you use this dashboard? So we've trained this very complex black box model that should be very accurate. So what do we want to use this, this black, uh, what do we want to use this dashboard for? Um, well, I, I think what you would want to use it for is uh, to build trust and understanding in your model. Okay, so we're going to try to use this interactive dashboard to build trust and understanding in the model. And uh, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to start from a global perspective, okay? Patrick? So, uh, yep, go ahead. Just one question before you go on. Please. And the yeah, model yeah, please. That, yeah, the model that popped out of your oven, as it were. Um, how, what kind of model is that, and, and is that something that driverless AI chooses, or you have some control over, or both? So it's a gradient boosting model, and for now it's H2O AI is going to choose that for you. So, so right now, H2O AI is going through this process, many, many iterations of designing features, trying them out, and it's always trying them in a 
uh, GBM, gradient boosting machine. So our final model is a gradient boosting machine on the best features from all of those iterations. Great, thanks. Okay, so yeah, so that model is right here, okay? So the, this green line that I just highlighted, turn it off, turn it back on. Okay, so that, that this, these are the predictions of the H2O AI model there that you're seeing in yellow. I probably said green before, maybe I'm a little colorblind, looks green to me, but need to say yellow. Okay, so uh, this thick yellow line is, is the predictions from that H2O AI model, and they're simply sorted. The x-axis is just a sorting. The x-axis almost has no meaning in this case, it's just a sorting going from the lowest predictions over here up to the high, on the left, going up to the highest predictions on the right. And then what you're seeing in white are the linear model predictions that we're going to use to explain this complex model. And, and right now we're looking at the global perspective. So this is, this is uh, a global linear surrogate model. Now, um, what I look at, I, I, I start to feel better about this model when I, when, I, when I look at this plot because I can see that I know I have defaults in my data set and I know that my predictions are, are getting able and being able to get up there and, and predict them because some of them are going up, you know, above 0.5, up even to 0.9. And if you have an imbalanced data set, you might not see this, right? And that would be one of your first clues that the model wasn't trustworthy, right? I've gotten some understanding of the model. I trust it more now because I can see my model is actually able to generate those high predicted probabilities above 0.5 even though this, this data set's a little bit unbalanced. So that's a good sign. Um, now switching down to this uh, global decision tree, surrogate model. What do we want to see here? Well, this is kind of like an overall um, approximate flow chart for the decision process of the complex model. So we want to check against our business expertise, which I have very little of, uh, does, does this make sense? To me as a user. So, so what do we see here? Well, we see that pay zero, remember it's high up in the tree. It's the top thing in the tree. So that means it's really important. And that makes sense because we've asked our customers. Uh, that makes sense that whether someone makes their very first, you know, their, their most recent payment is a very strong indicator of whether they're going to make their next payment. So, so we like that. That makes sense. Uh, and then we can see that, that these pay variables are sort of filling out the rest of the top levels of this tree along with someone's age. Um, so, so I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't, I don't see anything um, I, I don't like here, and, and it's kind of helping me trust the model more. If we want to get a little bit more information out of this tree, what we might do is go down the path to find them. All right, so these are the people that are least likely to default. Down here, their average... Uh, their average uh, predicted default is about 13%, 14%. And so these are all people who have um, paid their first payment, their most recent payment basically on time, and their second most re recent payment basically on time, and um, their, their third most payment, most recent payment on time. Okay, so that makes sense going down here to find the most likely people to pay off. They're all people who have been paying their bills. All right, so the opposite. What if we go down here and find the least likely people to pay off their bill? So who are these? Well, these are people who were late on their most recent payment. And I, I'm, this tool tip is coming up, so I'm seeing which categories went down this branch of the tree. I hope that's clear. I'm sorry. Uh, again, their third most recent payment, month, several months delayed. And finally, their fifth most recent payment, several months delayed, okay? So, so again, this makes sense, and, and what this is, is, is a sort of approximate overall flow chart of, of the complex model's decision process. Another thing I like is when I see the important variables in the overall global surrogate model matching to the important variables from the H2O AI GBM. So we see pay zero, pay zero, pay three, pay three, pay two, pay two. So this, it doesn't have to match completely, but it's a good sign when, when there's a good amount of overlap. So I'm seeing that, I'm feeling good about the model. And now let's look at partial dependence. 
And sorry, I have to move my little go to webinar console so I can see it. All right. Um, so partial dependence, does this make sense? Well, remember this is on average the, the prediction for a, for a value of y, for a value of, of an x variable. And in this case, our x variable is limit bound. So um, we can see here that people who had about a 10,000 Taiwanese dollar uh, limit balance, those were people were slightly more likely to default than people way out here who had a million Taiwanese dollar balance, okay? So this, this makes sense because we know um, balance, uh, limits on balances are a way that uh, creditors sort of factor in risk. So, that, so this, this should be this way. So this makes sense. People with lower balances more likely to default. People with uh, higher balances less likely to default. So, so right now I'm saying from a global perspective, this model looks pretty good. But we, all of these things would have been available to you before. So now we got to get into what's novel, what, what's really cool here. Like, and, and so that is the ability to zoom in locally and understand uh, the decisions that the model made for one single point. So um, let's do that. And I think if I was a business analyst, uh, the, the first thing I would be interested in is who are these people up here? Who are these people who are very likely to default? And on, according to the model. And so you can see every time I hover over a point, I'm getting some values on the screen. What are those values? Well, let's just pick one. Okay. So now when I click on it, I zoom in. And I've zoomed into the local region. So now in that top left uh, panel, you're seeing the uh, local linear surrogate model. And like Andy said, the way we're doing this is that it's in a cluster in the input. So it's a cluster around this, around this person, and we're building a local linear model there. And what, what are these numbers that are flashing up? Well, so I'm saying our K lime, that's our local linear model, because we built K of them. We built uh, K local linear models. And, and this model predicts about 0.8. And then the H2O model predicts about 0.8. 0.79. Well, the 0 0.81, 0 0.79. So these are these are in fairly good accordance, and that that's a good sign. That means the information that we extract from this local linear model is going to be very representative of of what happened with the person. So what are these numbers underneath? Well, these are what these are reason codes, and this is a term that we're borrowing um, from credit scoring. And what we're saying here is in this row for this person pay zero, move them up towards defaulting by 0.245 probability points according to the local linear model. Um, and we see that almost everything, their value for pay five, their value for pay six, their value for pay two, they all move them up towards defaulting. And we can tell you approximately by how much. We can tell you pay zero is positive and more important than pay five, which is also positive and more important than pay six. The only thing that pushes them down away towards defaulting is their value for pay three. Now, remember, I said these are approximate explanations, and they are approximate. So it, what would make me feel better about this? You know, what, what would make me feel confident going to my boss? Well, I'll tell you. So I also see over there on the right, the top right, that pay zero is important locally. The loco very, the loco local variable importance, which incorporates nonlinearity and interaction, is also saying, hey, pay zero, super important. What else is it telling you? Pay five and pay six are very important, okay? So now I would go to my boss. I feel like I would be confident enough going to my boss and saying, even though I have this really complex black box machine learning model, I can tell you the reasons this person defaulted or the reasons we shouldn't give this person a credit card in the future are because of pay, their values for pay zero, their values for pay five, and their values for pay six. And, and we want to make this even easier on the user. So uh, we just spell it out in plain English. Okay? So we're going to write it out for you. And, and it, these will match those values that we just saw in the dashboard. So their value for pay zero, because it was two months delayed, that increased their likelihood of defaulting by 24%. Pay two, two months delayed, that increased their um, likelihood of defaulting by 3%. So 
and we were saying pay five and pay six were also very important and you can see they have a little bit higher, they move them up a little bit higher. Now what you're seeing on the rest of the screen is the average behavior for the cluster and the average behavior uh, globally. So, so these are probably the most important, but if you're interested in getting sort of an overview description of what's going on in the cluster, the neighborhood around this point, and then globally we give those to you as well. So, um, Patrick, any, any quite, yeah, I, I had a feeling, Andy, I had a feeling. Go for it, please. <laughs> the, those reports are amazing. So just one question. This is yeah. obviously very um, important and critical in regulated industries like banking, as you, as in this example, but this ability to explain any instance could work, say, in the medical field. If you were evaluating a patient's health records, and it said they had, let's say, an 80% chance of getting diabetes in the next year, you could break that down and say 30% of that is from this factor, 20% is from their blood sugar, 10% is from that age. Does it, does it, it would work like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is certainly our hope. And I think the only caution I would give you is you, you got to remember, you know, we talked about approximate explanation. So if we say it's 30% because of, you know, some blood test, some blood enzyme level, you got to keep in mind that's approximately 30%. But, but that is exactly the idea and that is exactly what we're shooting for. So, but I so think, thanks for answering that question. I'm right, sorry, I asked that question. Go ahead. Well, I think the value of that is that it gives a professional, it, it allows them to feel comfortable with the model and the model is not now replacing them, it's becoming um, a toolkit to sort of assist them. Right, and, and that is exactly what we're hoping for. We're really hoping that, you know, and, and we're not the only people making these tools, even though this is the first time I've seen a dashboard like this. Um, we're really hoping that the work we're doing and others are doing is going to help bring machine learning into places where um, perhaps only linear models or perhaps only uh, rule-based systems were used in, in, in the past. And we know that this interpretability hurdle is a big hurdle. And so this is, this is our for, sort of uh, first moonshot towards that effort. So I, I'm gonna take uh, two more minutes and explain, and explain the, the rest of the local behavior. And, uh, and then I'm, we're gonna hand it over to you guys for questions. So, so what else is going on down here? So I click this point and I get my, my reason code for my linear model. And then I also see the local, local variable importance and I wanna see some correspondence between them. They don't have to match perfectly, but it makes me feel good when there's some correspondence between them. What else do I see on the screen? So uh, in the global uh, decision tree surrogate model, we've highlighted the path that this person would take. And so again, this makes sense. This makes us feel good about this model. This person with a high predicted probability, they're going to move down this path of they didn't pay their first bill, they didn't pay their third bill, they didn't pay their fifth bill. Uh, so this, this helps us get some, some insight into their behavior, right? Again, if we're wondering why do they have such a high probability of defaulting, well, we can come down here and look at the tree and say, well, they were uh, either two months, three months, four months, five months, six months, seven months, eight months delayed on pay zero. Uh, Let's see, probably the same, except uh, so a little bit. They could. There's a little bit wider uh, variation for pay three, and then for pay five, they were definitely late on pay five. So we can see exactly kind of what behaviors led to this predicted probability, this high predicted probability of default. Now we have one more thing over here to discuss. So what what do we do locally with partial dependence? Well, we do something called ICE, individual conditional expectations. And what that is, it is essentially just the predictions for this one person uh, run through many values of the limit balance. So what this is telling us is it looks like their limit balance was pretty low. Their limit balance was about uh, 20,000 Taiwanese dollars, so about right here where this red line crosses. But what this white line tells me, this white ice line tells me, is it wouldn't have mattered what their limit balance was. I take their row of the data set and I keep everything constant except for limit balance and I change through all the values. And I can see it wouldn't have mattered if their limit balance had been a million uh, Taiwanese dollars. There's, they still would have been predicted to be very likely to default. And I think what's really cool here, uh, and, and why, so, so the average behavior of the model is so low because most people paid their bill. So this is the average behavior down here. 
and we have this person who is uh, who is really likely to default up here. They're way outside the averages. And what I think is really cool is if we we pick a person a little bit lower, we'll see their ice line move down. Now this person who's sort of in the middle probability, now they're sort of in the high average. And if we pick down here, they're going to be below average or really close to average. So uh, we love giving people this ability to sort of explore explore the model uh, interactively and and uh, and get all this different information and see if they can tell a story that makes them both understand and trust this black box model. So so that's the goal. And with that, um, turn it back over to the slides, and we'll close out and get to your questions. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, uh, Andy, as well, for the wonderful talk. Um, so I have some, uh, this, was, this was very informative and illuminating for me, and hope, hopefully the audience felt the same way. Uh, before we come to the questions, I want to sort of um, have a few roundup items, follow-ups. Um, if you are interested in uh, learning more about um, using NVIDIA GPUs for accelerated analytics, there's a whole bunch of links uh, from the NVIDIA website. Um, there are a couple of email addresses as well that you can uh, reach out to. Um, you can contact them via their uh, Twitter uh, profile as well. Um, same thing, if you're interested in driverless AI or any of the H2O products, um, feel free to hit up our website at h2o.ai or one of the email links provided there, um, either through Twitter or through uh, email, and we'll be happy to respond back to you. Um, a few links uh, to learn more about what we talked today. Uh, you can check out Andy Sandbeck's uh, wonderful blog. Um, the link is up there, um, and you can also, uh, when we send a copy of the slides, you'll find the actual link, hyperlink there. Uh, it's up on blogs.nvidia.com. Uh, it gives a really good overview uh, about interpretability and the need for it. Um, we also have a follow meetup. Uh, that's uh, if you guys are in the Bay Area, uh, definitely do check it out. It's on 8:29, um, and that's going to be uh, in partnership with MathD and going to be hosted at NVIDIA headquarters in Santa Clara. Uh, so do check it out. Uh, if you can, if you go to h2o.ai/community, you'll find links to all of our meetups there. Um, the next um, uh, the next webinar coming up in the series is on 8:30. That's uh, end of the month. Um, that's on, the topic is automatic feature engineering with driverless AI. Uh, that's going to be delivered by uh, Dimitri Larco, who worked on a lot of the automatic feature engineering. So I know that is a lot of questions out there in the chat box. Uh, so tune in for that one to learn more about the automatic feature engineering. Uh, and finally, um, in, end of September, uh, 926, there is a Strata conference in New York. Um, both H2O and NVIDIA are going to have a booth there, and we'll be showing off all of the uh, software and the hardware components over there, so you can check out Driverless CI. Get a hands-on demo if you would like at our booth. Um, so, yeah, if you are in the New York area around the time, I encourage you to come to our booth and uh, talk to us. Um, well, thanks for Patrick. Um, Patrick is going to be doing another webinar on interpretability uh, uh, with Fast Forward Labs. Um, there's a link there um, that gives you that, so you can go ahead and check it out if you want to learn more about the topic uh, in general, um, and then uh, more details about what we are doing. Uh, and the link for uh, the startup conference is down there as well. There are a few uh, speaking uh, talks by NVIDIA and H2O folks, so uh, figure out which ones you want to attend. Okay. Uh, with that, I uh, want to thank everyone for attending, and we'll jump ahead since we have a little bit of time to the questions. So um, I got a few questions lined up. I'm going to go through them one by one and uh, try to pass it on. I, to, I see a lot of good questions in the in the question bar of a note, so. Yeah. Um, but so, uh, go, yeah however I'm, I'm, you want to do this. this, however you want to do this. Yeah, yeah. Let you go first. Continue. You go first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is the first one. Uh, this is a good one. Um, the question is, when you, uh, so this is for Patrick, when you made the knob settings right at the beginning of the experiment, um, when, uh, so this is the lever for interpretability along that next to accuracy and time, the question was, did you not lose the interpretability uh, because you picked the low number? Uh, because, uh, and primarily the question is, feature engineering and ensembling might make it complex. Um, but that's, uh, that's a good question, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it is a good question. So, so I said, and I might have said it too quickly, I was going to turn down the interpretability uh, to try to give ourselves a challenge. And I think you saw that we could still interpret the model fairly well. But, but the, the questioner is right. I did turn down the interpretability, which allows the model to use a wider range of sort of more complex features. 
If you turn up the interpretability, the model is going to use a more narrow range of less complex features. And we do we have plans for uh, giving giving uh, even finer tune, uh, finer grain control over the interpretability in the future. But right now, that's what I did. I turned it down, which allowed the model to have a wider range of more complex features to choose from. And I I hope you were convinced that we were still able to interpret the model. Very good. Um, I know I also saw you a bunch of questions around uh, the feature engineering process. Um, I think uh, it would be uh, you know unfair for us to either of us to do justice. Uh, you should definitely listen to Dimitri Lark to talk about it in two weeks. Uh, but I can say this really quickly. Um, uh, what we do is we uh, uh, we have five of the grandmasters uh, from Kaggle uh, who are for H2O, and what they've done is they've taken all their uh, years of expertise playing all these different Kaggle computations and uh, taken those recipes. Um, and those, that, that's what's happening under the hood. Uh, we're trying a whole set of different permutations and combinations for feature engineering and picking the best ones that improve accuracy. Uh, but to learn more about it, I would encourage you to attend the webinar. Okay. Um, so there's another question here, of Patrick. Um, how is target imbalance problem, uh, how is the target imbalance problem handled by the model? Uh, mm, that's that is a very good question, and and uh, that is something we're we're actually discussing right now internally how how to handle this. So so in this case, target imbalance was not a problem, but if there was an extreme imbalance in the target, uh, I think we would need to reweight some of those higher probability predictions in the linear model, the Lyme linear models, to make sure they get higher up, and. Um, and I think I'll just I'll say that that's a very good point by the question and something we're still considering how to fix internally. We this is something that we we just recently encountered in our testing internally, and it's something we're we're thinking about how to fix it. We did some preliminary experiments where we uh, in a binary classification problem, if we can tell the the primary target event, you know, essentially one. Sometimes it's not one though. Uh, if if there are a few ones, then we know we probably need to wait. The, uh, the predicted rows, the predicted probabilities that are associated with those ones, we need to give them a higher weight in the data set when we fit the local linear models. But that's a great question. Perfect. So here's um, uh, another question which I uh, uh, think is interesting. Um, so the, the text we, we showed for the English explanation, the question was, is the text auto-generated or is that a, a mechanism for uh, customizing the text based on the features. And I think that's a good point because um, depending on the features, if it's months in this case, you had the point that it, it shows a number of months, but it could be gender, for example. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you customize the text? So, so right now, I mean, we just have kind of a complex series of if-then rules that are based on, you know, the number of categories, if it's a categorical variable. It, it's not something the user can customize right now, and I, you know, I, I'm not sure if that will change or not in the future, but right now it's something that we generate sort of based on whether it's a numeric value, whether it's a categorical value, how many values are, if it's a categorical variable, how many different categories are there. So right now we're kind of using uh, just some, some, you know, kind of a complicated set of, you know, easy rules that interact together to, to uh, to make those decisions to generate the text. So right now it's auto-generated and, and not customizable. Cool. Uh, here's another question. Um, this one says, uh, how many features can you work with? We have a data set of 1,300 features to start with. Ooh, that's quite a bit. Um, so in, in terms of the machine learning piece itself, portion itself, that's, that's not a problem. We can definitely handle uh, many features. But the question, it's a good question for interpretability. How do you handle those many features on the interpretability dashboard? Patrick? Mm. Okay, so so this is another discussion we have internally a lot, and our basic our basic strategy is to summarize. So so we I personally feel that I could show you information for 1,300 different variables, and then if we think about the derived feature possibilities, I mean it, it could get up into the hundreds or thousands of millions of variables. Um, I could show you information about all those variables, but but that's probably not a good idea. I personally myself wouldn't consider that interpretable. So what we do is we try to summarize. We try to say, of your 1,300, of your 100,000 variables, whatever it is, here's the top three for this row. 
that move it up, that move this person up towards defaulting or up towards testing positive or, or up towards surviving. Here's the bottom three that move them away from this. So great question. And that, that's something we talk about internally at H2O all the time. Because we know people have wide data. Um, so a bunch of questions around uh, is Dallas CI available? Uh, what's the uh, status on in terms of the product availability? Uh, and I can take that. Um, um, so we are currently in beta. A lot of our early customers are testing it out right now, um, getting a, giving a lot of positive feedback uh, that is going into the product, back into the product. Um, so um, yeah, please you know go to the website. If you go to itch.ai slash travelersai. Uh, there's a link right up on the home page, um, and uh, right at the bottom you have a form. If you are interested in the beta, please sign up for that, and we are going to get to you uh, as we work through the list of uh, interested folks. Um, but yeah, the product is available in beta right now, um, and hopefully, uh, we're hoping by startup we should be able to uh, have general availability for the software itself. Um, there, so there's another question over here. Um, So how do you, uh, so th this is a good question. Um, well, um, I guess maybe Andy can chime in a bit. Is, uh, do you really need GPUs for, for AI? AI? Um, and uh, so, my, so the answer for that is uh, it's highly recommended because um, as you can see, we build thousands of models in this iteration. And, um, and if you look at our, some of our previous webinars, we talked about how using the GPU accurate algorithms have given us uh, speed ups of anywhere from uh, you know, 6 to 40x on different algorithms for different uh, numbers of GPUs. And when you're building so many models, you want every, every all the acceleration possible to be able to build models in reasonable amount of time. Uh, Andy, do you want to chime in? Yeah, and as you, as you build more complex models with bigger data, you can move to not just a single GPU per model, but multi-GP algorithms that are using multiple GPUs. And so then you can really get into training times where training each model takes a significant amount of time and then training thousands of models to understand which features are best, which model combinations are best. You have so many permutations that you can get into training times that are days or weeks or conceivably even months. And at that point, that's if you didn't have GPUs. And so then GPUs, when you, when you accelerate by a factor of 10, 20 or more, it really collapses back the exercise into a reasonable time. It'll turn something that would take, you know, overnight into just an hour or something that would take a month into a day. So that's really a significant factor, we think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just uh, getting the insights, but it's also getting the insights uh, in, in time. I mean, the thing that time to insights has become very critical for enterprises. You want to be able to make those decisions really soon. And uh, GPUs are absolutely critical for being able to do that. And I think when we question data scientists, a lot of time what we find is that they'll, for training and building their models and getting performance and feature engineering, they'll allocate a fixed amount of time. They won't set the bar at a certain performance level. Of course, there's probably a threshold you need to pass. But they'll say, I'm going to spend a day on it or a week or this project is a month. And then you sort of, within reason, get what you get. So the idea is that if you can accelerate the process of trying many more combinations in a smart way, you're going to get much more high performance results in the same time, or conversely, you can get results like what you're used to much faster, and you can crank through many more problems. You can sort of spend the compute power either way. Thank you, Andy. Uh, uh, Patrick, a question for you. Um, are you able to are you able to optimize or choose different loss functions? And uh, if so, how do you pick the best one automatically? So we're we're able to um, choose between different loss metrics. I think you may have seen on the on the beginning screen, and maybe if I go back, um, you can see that we can choose between different um, different loss metrics. So R squared, AUC, RMSE, MSE, MAE, and log loss. Uh, and then I think the, the loss function is going to be associated with uh, the type of problem it is, whether it's binary classification, um, uh, you know, multinomial classification or regression in the actual GBM. And that, that is not, uh, I'm not, I'm not qualified to answer that question. If, if, clicking on these things actually changes that or if that uh, just 
or if that just changes the way that uh, we're presenting the error. I'm not sure about that. That's a good question. Yeah, but I, but I, 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 I saw a couple questions. Ahead. Go ahead. No, I think you have to select it ahead of time before you start the experiment. Uh, once you start the experiment, it just shows you what was picked. Uh, but yeah. uh, if you don't pick anything, it'll show you which one is picked automatically. Uh, but you can change it after you're done the experiment. Yeah, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this changes the law, the actual loss function, or if it just changes what um, what's reported. But that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two last questions. Uh, can I can I can I pick a couple? Yeah. Can I try to address a couple I'm seeing? So so basically, is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So uh, so basically, I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of questions that I think are very good questions about. Hey, what what do we do if the linear model isn't a good fit? Like maybe over here, okay? And and I want to go back for this point. For this point, the linear model isn't such a good fit for the um, for the very complex H2O AI model. And uh, I I think the reason codes probably in this case. I, I think in many of these cases, the reason codes would still be somewhat accurate, and we do give you a measure of how accurate they are based on the distance from the point to the line. But in this case, for something that's really an outlier, I would fall back to my nonlinear loco derived uh, variable importances. And that's, that's why we provide two different perspectives. We want to provide this linear perspective that doesn't consider uh, interactions and we want to provide this nonlinear perspective that does consider interactions. So when the when the linear model struggles to get very close, we want you to fall back to these nonlinear local variable importances. So that was a very good question. Um, and then let's see. I think there were some other questions. If if we have time for one more and you you see one first but note, I just kind of saw a lot along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think um, there are a bunch of questions around uh, the product itself. Is it regarding whether uh, Driver CI is uh, open source or closed source, uh, and uh, whether um, interpretability, machine learning interpretability is available uh, separately? So um, to answer that question, uh, Driver CI is an enterprise license software product, uh, so you do need an enterprise license for running it. Um, uh, and machine learning interpretability is going to be uh, a part of Driver CI at this point. So you, if you buy Driver CI, you get that along with it. Okay. Well, this was really fun. Uh, yeah, thanks, I think that's Andy. All we have thanks for now. Thank you, Patrick, for the wonderful talk. Thank you, Andy, for joining us today. Um, uh, and um, just for the for the folks in the audience, uh, we'll send you a copy of the slides, as I mentioned earlier, and we'll try to answer some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we can uh, satisfy all the questions in the meantime. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.